Three, that search me and know my heart, Psalm 139, 23, that's crucial to healing this heart hardening virus of legalism. And Mark 3, it says, on the Sabbath, Jesus came into a synagogue where he saw a man with a withered hand. Verse 2 says, the Pharisees held their breath. Would Jesus cure this man on the Sabbath in front of everybody? Like, you'd think they'd be happy about that prospect, wouldn't you? No, they're not. It says, if so, they could charge him with breaking the Sabbath law. Talk about upside down. Well, pastor, you know, we had somebody that was manifesting a demon during worship today. It wasn't me, was it? Leading worship, that would be a problem. Uh, but, you know, that's not a good look for anybody who's visiting here. If somebody's manifesting demons, can't we, can't we tell people not to do that? No. If you have a demon, the altar is the best place to get rid of it. If you can't get rid of it in church, you're in the wrong church because we would hope that would happen. Because when you leave it here, it's not coming back. You don't have to take, I'm not saying anything against taking meds. I'm just saying that if people are taking meds, we still could have the aspiration to say, you're going to get completely healed, like Mary talked about, completely healed. And once your immune system kicks in, that thing, you don't need the medicine. So I'm sorry if something looks a little out of line to you about somebody, but maybe that's the exact thing that needed to happen. Maybe that the worship is what caused the, the demons to manifest. And, you know, I heard Bill Johnson say one time when that man that was in the, in the graves, uh, the Gadara, uh, the demoniac of Gadara, uh, if you follow through, after the demons were cast out, it said there were 2,000 pigs, right? So, like, we know he had at least 2,000 demons, <laughs> Bill Johnson said. And we also know that he ran up to Jesus and fell down and started worshiping first. So if 2,000 demons can't stop him from worshiping, what's stopping us? <laughs> Probably end the sermon right there, couldn't I? Oh, no, they were going to try to charge him with breaking the Sabbath law. And that's part of what legalism is. It's looking at the micro picture and missing the big picture. And if anybody ever saw the big picture, it was Jesus. And, and if ever there was a time that we don't want to be legalistic and we want to model Christianity as something that allows Holy Spirit to keep talking to us all day long, every day, to keep studying Scripture, not just reading it, but studying it, to put those deposits in our hearts so when the time comes, we're ready to make a withdrawal because something was put in there first. That season is right now in America. You don't have to read very far in the press to see how people are calling wokeism a new religion. And it's the most legalistic religion you've ever seen because there's no forgiveness and there's no mercy. They would say that they're very compassionate, but that keeps changing based on which group they want to say that they stand for. And when I say they, it, they're not the enemy. I'm, not, I'm never saying that. We're, we're not wrestling against flesh and blood. It's against principalities and powers. You know the rest, right? What else? Rulers of darkness, spiritual wickedness in high places, right? So Holy Spirit wins over all those things. And if we make the person our enemy, they shut down. They can't hear it. But if you're modeling a different way of living that does show compassion and does show mercy and is willing to forgive other people when they, when they hurt you, then you are anti-legalistic. You're, you're demonstrating the power of what it looks like to be able to forgive someone. And this culture today, that's a very missing element, except the fact that it's built right into everything about Christianity. So they weren't healing anybody on the Sabbath, so they would rather this guy wait till tomorrow to get healed. Like, what? You're not going to pray for his healing tomorrow either. So Jesus knew their hearts. Say, Jesus knows our hearts. Uh, just want to remind you. He called to the man with the withered hand, Jesus, come to me. Then he turned to the Pharisees with a question. Do our laws tell us to do good or evil on the Sabbath, to save life or to snuff it out? They remained silent. That happened a lot when he talked to the Pharisees. They'd start with a question, and then it says, after he answered that one, they never asked another question after that. Jesus was furious as he looked out over the crowd. He was grieved by their hard hearts. You know, I think part of the furious part was, look at all these sick people that are in the church. They weren't hard-hearted. It was the leaders who were supposed to be representing the Father's business 
of the, of the kingdom in the earth. And they were misrepresenting the heart of the Father because of their hard-heartedness kept forcing them to say, well, Linda, you know, you didn't get an 800 on your SAT, so you failed. Right? It's always about keeping the law and having the best score and all of these things. And Paul the Apostle said, oh, man, I used to think that was the most important thing, but I realize it's by faith. It's just got to be by faith. He accepts me as I am, and he loves me the way I am, but he loves me so much he doesn't want me to stay where I am. He wants me to shift and transformation and sanctification, all these wonderful words that you read in the Bible. He's grieved by the hard hearts. So Jesus says to the man with the withered hand, so be it, stretch out your hand. And you know, we just put ourselves in it for a minute and say, well, I can't. It's withered. But notice in the Bible that he's always asking us to do things that we can't do. Step out of the boat, Peter. I don't even have a life jacket. This is what happens, see? But that's why by faith is, is one of those mystical things that happens. You could, you could try to tell me you don't believe, but you'll never tell me that I don't know. Mary will never be able to be convinced that God doesn't still heal. Because it's her testimony now. It's a part of who she is. Don't you tell me he can't do it. Another Brandon Lake song. Yeah, right, he can. But it says, the man stretched forth his hand. Hallelujah. Wow, in church. He got healed in church. But it says, as he did, right? There's that first step, Peter, coming out of the boat. As he did, it was completely healed. So God expects, he'll give us the directions, but then we have to take that first step, don't we? Oh, it's a deep subject. Isn't this promise amazing in Ezekiel 36? I will plant a new heart and a new spirit inside of you. I will take your stubborn, stony heart and give you a willing, tender heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit inside you and inspire you to live by my statutes and follow my laws. What a gift. That's Old Testament. We have it in the New Testament. The Spirit's been poured out, and we receive it, and then we yield to Holy Spirit in our lives. And then Jeremiah similarly said, this is the kind of new covenant I will make with the people of Israel when those days are over. I will put my law within them. I'll put my law within them, and I'll write it on their hearts. I'll be their God, and they'll be my people. Above all else, watch your brain. Oh, wrong version. Watch your, put your hand on your heart. I will guard my heart. Oh, diligently guard it. Because from a sincere and pure heart come the good and noble things of life. It's not my brain. It's my heart. Brain's important, right? Don't take mine away until I'm gone. But the heart's more important. That's what God said. Above all else. And Matthew 15 says, what you put into your mouth can't make you clean or unclean. It's what comes out of your mouth that can make you unclean. It says, out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth. Mm -hmm. Just saying. So Luke 12, verse 1. Guard yourselves from the yeast. <sighs> the yeast that puffs up the Pharisees. Tell me that's not a descriptive word. What does that mean? Well, you know, in Matthew, again, in the Sermon on the Mount, he said, when you give an offering, don't puff yourself up and show everybody, look at this big offering I have. You know, you'll get what you wanted, which is recognition, but he went on to say right there, he says, what you do in secret will be rewarded openly. Guard yourselves from the yeast that puffs up the pride and the ego that puffs up the Pharisees, hypocrisy, false appearance, trying to look better than you really are. See, so it's not that... They want it to be this way, let's just say. It's there's something about a hard heart that allows arrogance to start rising up on the inside because we lose identity with the common person who all of us were before we got saved. But now I'm saved and I don't do drugs anymore, so I look down on people who do drugs? No, because but for the grace of God, that could still be me. How about having compassion on that person? That's not being puffed up with the yeast of the Pharisees, that's being humble and recognizing that could be me. And it was me, by the way. 
And then in Amos, just if you need a, a, a little reality check in the Old Testament, Amos didn't really mince words. And God said through him, stop making that music for me. He was referring to the worship service. It's noise. <laughs> I haven't ever gotten that word, thankfully, but maybe somebody here today. I will not listen to the melodies you play on the harp. Here's what I want. Let justice thunder down like a waterfall. You want to know what heaven thinks is good music? Justice. It makes a sound like rushing water. When, when we operate in that mercy and that forgiveness that he gives us, it's a sound to heaven and not that kiss the ring. Yeast. Some people are getting triggered, sorry. John 16. Oh, the spirit of truth. How many are glad you got the spirit of truth? Well, then how can we lie? If we got the spirit of truth, because he's in the closet, and you got the key, and you locked him in there. Just hang on a second, Jesus. I'll be right back. <laughs> this is what he says. <laughs> this is probably really hard for them to understand. My departure will be a gift. How could the departure of Jesus ever be a gift? Well, we know, but they didn't. So he had to warn them, like, what? How could you not being here be a gift to us? That will serve you well because if I don't leave, the helper will not come to your aid. When I leave, I will send him to you. And when he arrives, he will uncover the sins of the world and expose. Ouch. Unbelief is a sin. So lack of faith is unbelief. You're believing in something else besides what the Lord said. And again, no condemn, not condemning anybody, but... He clearly says that's one of the roles of the Holy Spirit is to show us that that's a sin and allow all to see their sins. <laughs> this is pretty deep stuff. The Holy Spirit's going to allow everybody to see their sins in the light of righteousness, but not the righteousness that comes from the scribes and Pharisees. This new kind of internal righteousness that you're going to have because my spirit's going to dwell right on the inside of you, just like Ezekiel and Jeremiah said. Now, wouldn't it be just like the devil to make the Holy Spirit the number one topic of division throughout the body of Christ in America? You know that's true, right? Huh. Well, that should tell us something. Anyway, they should all know that we're right. Just kidding. That's puffing up the yeast again, see? You think you got all the answers. Well, maybe not. But look at this. When he arrives, he'll uncover the sins of the world, expose unbelief as sin, and allow all to see their righteousness for the first time in the light of this God kind of righteousness, not by fulfilling the law, but by living it out and, and keeping this as the altar of your life because it says they're going to see that for the very first time. And sometimes when you see sin exposed in your life, you want to, it's that flight mechanism kicks in. So he's very good about how this happens in us, in my opinion, is that he'll reveal things to you that he knows are high up on the list that you can get some wins. When I first got saved, I didn't realize how much I cursed because it had become so natural to me. But it was just started leaking out. And they're like, well, you know, you're a Christian now. You don't have to say that. They were very kind to me. Huh, the music I was listening to, like none of that seemed obvious right away. So... This is kind of a new self-awareness of righteousness, it says right there in John 16. And it's important because I'm going to the Father and will no longer be present with you. So I'm not asking you to rely on me to tell you what to do all the time. You've got my word and you've got my spirit living inside of you. Now you have to own this yourself. But I don't want to. It's too much work. He, the Holy Spirit, will also carry my judgment. Now again, be careful how you read that because it's not that... You've been deputized to go tell everybody how wrong they are. Your discernment. He will have the same advice that I would have given you if I was here, but you need faith to believe that. I have so much more to say, but your circuits are breaking right now. <laughs> the spirit of truth will come and guide you in all truth. Like He won't speak his own words to you. He'll speak what he hears. The Holy Spirit will speak what he hears and reveal to you the things to come. All right, I'm going to jump ahead again. Acts 10. I, I think if I had to summarize this, I'll kind of go through it quickly, but 
This is one of those beautiful um, displays of how the Lord will work with two separate people through the Holy Spirit that he wants to sync up and meet. But my, I guess the warning I would have is be careful that when these things get said to us, we don't dismiss them because we might be missing that day of visitation that the Lord speaks about. Because it could be any day at any time God could open up a door, a spiritual door of opportunity that he wants you to do something. You remember Ananias when God said, you know, I want you to go. There's a man that's waiting to come. What if he said no? Well, God would have found somebody else. But we're talking about Ananias right now, how he faced the fear and went and did it anyway. So similarly, there was a man named Cornelius who lived in Caesarea. Now, that you, there's two different cities at least in the Bible one of them is Caesarea Philippi, which is where the gates of hell are. But this is the Caesarea that was right on the coast. And again, I, I, we were there, and I didn't know any of this until we went to Israel and visited this place. So I'll tell you a little bit about it. He was the captain of the Italian guard. Now, that doesn't mean much to us, other than he was in the military. But that was the guard of the palace where Herod would come. When he came from Rome, he would land right there, and he had a palace. So I never knew this. I always thought that Peter was just going to the house of Cornelius. I figured he was a guy in the military, right? No. He was going to the compound where Herod was when he was there. And Peter's a fisherman, right? It says about Peter in another place, they saw that they were uneducated men. What am I doing going to the palace? God gave you the assignment. So believe it and step out. This man was thoroughly good, and he led everyone in his house to worshipfully I'm sorry, the live worshipfully before God, helping people in need, and he had the habit of prayer. Say that to somebody. You should have the habit of prayer. I should have the habit of prayer. We should all be praying all the time. But I can't. I got a job. See, you got the wrong picture. If ever there's a place you need to pray, it's on your job. <laughs> Right? So if you think prayer is just bringing a list of needs to God, you're missing this whole dialogue that he wants you to have with him all day long. And this man, Cornelius, is going about the discipline of his life was to be a man of prayer. He had a habit of doing this. And one day at 3 in the afternoon, he had a vision. An angel of God, as real as his next door neighbor, came in and said, Cornelius. What? Cornelius stared hard, wondering if he was seeing what he was seeing. What? What do you want, sir? Because, you know, military, what do you want, sir? The angel said, your prayers and neighborly acts have brought you to God's attention. Huh, he's a Roman. He's one of the enemies of Israel. But when this guy prayed, God heard him. Maybe you'll be surprised who you see in heaven. <laughs> Here's what you're to do, Cornelius. Send men to Joppa to get Simon, the one they call Peter. He's staying with Simon the tanner, whose house is down by the sea. Cornelius sent two servants, and I like this, and one particularly devout soldier from the guard. So this man might have been a disciple of Cornelius. He's working for the Roman army. He could have been one of the people I was asked to put the spear into the side of Jesus. Right? Like, that's the enemy. And yet, this man prayed too. So now three people show up at Peter's house. He went with them into detail everything that had happened. So they go off the next day as these three travelers... Two servants and a soldier, right? It's going to matter in a minute. They're approaching the town. Peter went out on the balcony to what? Well, it looks like he had a habit of prayer too, didn't he? Look at somebody say, you should have a habit of prayer. <laughs> what did the preacher talk about today? <laughs> like that guy. Peter got hungry and started thinking about fasting. No, oh, sorry, no. Peter got hungry and started thinking about lunch. While lunch was being prepared, he fell into a trance and saw the skies open up. Something that looked like a huge blanket lowered by ropes at the four corners settled on the ground. And every kind of animal and reptile and bird that you could think of was on it. And then a voice came, go to it, Peter, kill and eat. No, Lord, I've never so much as tasted food that wasn't kosher. Leave it to Eugene Peterson, right? This is the message Bible. No, I, I follow the rules that you gave us. But the voice came a second time and said, if God says it's okay, it's okay. This part of legalism, though, that we have to really think about, it's a delicate subject because it doesn't mean that we're not called to follow what Jesus says to do. 
But there's every man does not live by bread alone and woman, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. I think part of the problem of legalism is we put everything in a grid, and if it happened this way once, then we should apply the exact same rules this time and this time. No, I think it's way too more much more complex in a good way. It's because God loves everybody. He didn't treat the woman at the well the same way he treated the woman that was caught in adultery. Even though they were both in sin, he had a different way of speaking to them because he was reading the situation in the moment. And he starts by believing the best about people, not pointing out their sin. Okay, Peter's like, okay, but then it happened three times, so <laughs> we don't know exactly which part is three times, if it came up and down three times, or if Peter said no, I only eat kosher, God. <laughs> right? So I don't know. He had to be encouraged. And as Peter, puzzled, sat there trying to figure out what it all meant. Now think about this for a minute. Here's Cornelius over here on the, uh, at Caesarea in the palace of the king. He's praying, and God speaks to him. And three men get sent over to Peter's house. And then, you know, they get very specific instructions to come to this guy Sam, Simon the Tanner's house. And Peter's praying separately, and this vision comes. Hmm. As Peter puzzled, sat there, trying to figure out what it all meant, the men sent by Cornelius arrived, and they called in. Is anybody named Simon here? They also call him Peter. Peter, lost in thought, didn't hear them, so the Spirit whispered to him. Again, look at the person next to you. The Spirit is whispering to you. Are you listening? Because you'll really do better if you listen to him. But it was just a whisper. It was just a whisper. So if I'm not listening, I won't hear you. The spirit whispered to him. Three men are knocking at the door looking for you. Get down there and go with them and don't ask any questions. Probably the hardest part right there. Why? How do I know you're the spirit? Because the devil wouldn't tell you to do it most of the time. Don't ask any questions. I sent them to get you. Just do what they say. Man, that takes some faith, doesn't it? Then he goes down, and he sees a Roman soldier at his house. What would you think? Ah! What happens when that light goes on behind you when you're driving? Can't be me, Lord. Must be somebody else's. Let me pull over. I never make any mistakes. And you're like, Shababa Kesota. <laughs> My insurance bill is high enough. <laughs> right? So Peter goes down and he says, I think I'm the man you're looking for. They told me not to ask any questions, but what's up? <laughs> what is a Roman soldier knocking on the house of Simon the Tanner? Am I in trouble? He didn't, you know, that's all implied here, but he didn't say that. The next morning he got up and went with them. A day later, they entered Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had all his relatives and close friends waiting there with him. Now listen, you're Peter, and you're, you're not allowed to ask any questions. You're just going with a Roman soldier and two servants. Like, well, I could be going to my death for all I know. And they're taking him to the palace on the, on the water, on the Mediterranean Sea. When we were there, there's still uh, evidence of the palace being there. We saw the tiled... Uh, uh, in the water, uh, the tiles of the swimming pool that Herod had. It was amazing. Huh, I'm a fisherman. What am I doing at the palace? This has got to be bad. He's not allowed to ask any questions. So they're expecting him. Peter walks in and he's not getting arrested. He's being welcomed by this Roman soldier. Everyone who had come in and Peter addressed them. You know, I'm sure that this is, <laughs> you know I'm sure this is highly irregular. Like, Jews just don't do this. We don't sit down and eat with pagans. We don't even go into the house of a pagan. Never mind when there's a Roman guard there. And now I'm in the palace, like, what am I doing here? I haven't been allowed to ask any questions. Can you relate? Yeah, see, he's just asking you to be obedient and just do it and not try to figure everything out all the time. Put in a worship song. <laughs> That's the best what if. But what if this happens? What if that happens? What if you put a worship song in? That's a good one. Hmm. But God has just shown me, he just showed me that no race is better than any other. Somebody better say amen. amen. 
Somebody better say amen. amen. Because he's thinking he's in trouble. They welcome him and say, we want to hear from you. And now it's like, oh, my God. He even wants to save a Roman soldiers? Thank you. No race is better than any other. The minute I was sent for, I came. No questions asked? Well, he did say what's up, but we'll let him pass on that. But now I'd like to know why did you send for me? Because <laughs> everything I thought was off. Four days ago at about this time at mid-afternoon, I was home praying. Suddenly there was a man right in front of me flooding the room with light. He said, Cornelius, your daily prayers and your neighborly acts have brought you to God's attention. Send to Joppa to get Simon, the one they call Peter. So I did, and you've been good enough to come. Now we're all here in God's presence, ready to listen to whatever the master put in your heart to tell us. The exact opposite of what he probably thought. I'm in trouble. Why would a Roman soldier come and get me? No, because there's a guy in the palace who prays. <sighs> Talk about putting it upside down. I'm going to ask you to stand. Aren't you happy? <laughs> Good to see you, Dick. You know, like in England, they say the penny drops. It's like the light bulb just goes on in Peter's heart. Like, oh my God, I thought I was going to get arrested. Not only that, they're calling me to tell them the gospel in the palace. The last place I'd expect it. Maybe that's how you look at your job. I would go, when we first started the church, I would go up to the Market Street Mission and do the, the they called it devotions in the morning. Like they had a chapel service for all the guys. And that's like people fresh off the street. Some of them still had the heroin in their blood, right? Like they were still high because they had just gotten there. And I'm going to preach a message to them. Yeah. Right, because I used to, I didn't do heroin, but I was a drug addict. I should not be here right now. So, yeah, I'm going to tell them the power of the gospel. And that's what Peter, in, in reverse, but why I told you that is because then I would leave there and go into New York City and make a presentation at a board meeting in one of these big corporations. Right, like talk about two ends of the spectrum. But two groups of people who needed Jesus. Who doesn't need Jesus? There's not a person that ever lived that wouldn't be better off having the Lord than not. I don't care how big they are and how, how nice the conference room is, how much money they have. They're bound by different demons. And not always that either. <laughs> okay. So he's like, wait a minute. Peter's like, boom. The revelation hits him. It's God's own truth. Nothing could be plainer. God plays no favorites. Well, then a legalistic attitude in our heart is that we are playing favorites because we're judging people and think that we're better than them. And I'm sorry to say that in the practice of Christianity, that's the main opposition most people would complain about is they're too judgmental. So something about loving the sinner but hating the sin, that's very hard to apply, isn't it? And when you get online and you start putting capital letters in and flaming people, that, that might not be the exact representation of Holy Spirit that that you want to show, but did you pray? Yes. He told me to make it all caps. You might need a little fixing on the tuner there who you're listening to. Maybe not. What authority do you have to tell them what to do? Have they submitted to your authority? Did they come and ask you for advice? Well, they might, they might still get mad at you even if they do come and ask you for advice. But no, most of the time. So where do you get off thinking that you should be judge and jury here, right? So he's like, wait a minute. My whole paradigm is shifting in the moment that I'm standing in this palace. It's God's own truth. Nothing could be plainer. He plays no favorites. It doesn't matter who you are or where you're from. If you want God and are ready to do as he says, you have to join a church. <laughs> Sorry telling you no yes join the church if you want but that's not the condition here if you want God and you're ready to do as he says the door is open you might be on death row and you're never going to be able to get out and get to a church you can't get baptized but you could still know the Lord 
Think of the thief on the cross. That's exactly what it was. But religion has stacked it all up like it's this impossible thing. And then when we aren't acting the way people would think of the Bible as Christians, they'll know you're Christians by your love. See, be careful. You know that your motive is love, but you don't want to be legalistic about it. I really think if I ever do write a book, and I'm planning to, this is going to be a big emphasis of it, is that we can know the word, but if we're not translating it into our behavior of Christ's likeness, that should be the main thing that we love about each other. That you look at other people and say, man, I really admire the way you walk it out. I really admire how you're living the life of Christ. I'm, I'm reminded of his heart when I'm with you. And that is not a sermon that you have to give. It's just a way to live life. Now I'm supposed to tell you what a great guy I am. No, <laughs> sorry. But what he wants from us is authentic. You know, I'm sorry, but a lot of people don't even think that God would like the authentic you. <laughs> he already knows the authentic you. And he wants you to come out and stop trying to be what somebody else wants you to be. Be what God wants you to be. And that would be our role here as a church is just to come in and be part of the community, go to a life group, go, go to fellowship today, sit around and talk with people. I've never been at a church service that went two and a half hours. Well, come at 1130 next time. I don't know. Like, it's like a buffet. Here it is. The message he sent to Israel that through Jesus Christ, everything is being put together again. He's doing it everywhere, among everyone. And that wasn't harder to believe for anybody but Peter, because he thought he had to live within all these rules and he wasn't even allowed to sit down and eat with unbelievers. And we know that because Paul confronts him later, right? Like, what happened? You got free and now you're going back into the bondage of making people eat kosher again? Don't you remember when you were in Cornelius' house and you're talking to a Roman soldier the enemy of enemies, and he's inviting you in to speak. Oh my God, help us, Lord. You can raise your hands. Help me, Lord, to be more open to what you want to show me. Take down that asymptomatic legalism in my life and show me, reveal to me if I've been too hard-hearted. Your word says that. It grieved your heart at the hard-heartedness of the people that he was expecting to do your work, and we don't want to fall victim to that hard-hearted stiff-necked attitude that we think we know better than everybody else. Soften our hearts, Lord. That's the key. Soften our hearts to not be so hard-hearted. And give us that promise of Ezekiel that you said you'd put that new spirit in us. And you'll put the new spirit in our children and our family members and our co-workers, the people who we're counting on for you to shift their lives. We want to be in partnership with you every day. Move mightily through us, through your people. And listen, if you're here today, I'm not asking for any big dramatic thing other than if this rings true to you, what we've been talking about today, and you never looked at church as the answer, maybe you just got invited here with somebody and you, you said, sure, why not? This is really key, just to make that first step, that first decision. That's what it says. He's doing it everywhere among anyone. And if you want God and are ready to do as he says, the door is open. But you've got to take the step. And this altar is not a bad place to do it. Take the step forward to come to the altar and say, I don't have it all figured out yet, but I know what I'm doing now is not working. And this sounds like there's a bunch of people here who think you're right. <laughs> I hope that's true. And that you have nothing to lose and a lot to gain by giving Jesus a chance. You guys agree with me on that? Can you make some noise? Yeah. Best decision you could ever make is to say yes to Jesus. So if that's you, you could come up here to this altar right now. You can say, you know what? I'm tired of running away from God, and I'm going to go toward God. I'm going to be drawn to him now, not be repelled or feel like they're going to shame me or lecture me. No, it's not about shaming and lecturing anybody. It's about this door being open. If you want God and you're ready to do as he says, the door is open. You can come on up for prayer. And I'm not going to force anybody to do anything against your will. He loves you enough to let you make your own decision. But if there's a stirring in your heart, take a step forward. Anybody else who needs prayer, we're going to be here to pray. Yes, I said there's fellowship uh, across the campus at the Recreation Center. 
So spend time with your brothers and sisters. Get to know people. If you can't, God bless you. We love you. Lord, I bless your people. I thank you for the tribe at King of Kings and for the radical remnant that you've raised up in this region. I bless them as they go to be everything that you called them to be in Jesus' name. Everybody said, from the balcony, they said, amen. <laughs> love you all.